Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conversation presented by White House Custom Color. Are you trying to mute me? No, it's just real loud. And I, can't... I sold Amazon, but it was $25. <laughs> listening to listen, not listening to respond. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. How's it going? Awesome. How are you? Oh, you have a really fancy camera. I like that depth of field. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's my nice camera all hooked up. <laughs> you know, you should do that too. You're I, constantly on camera. I know. I should. I should have a nice one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't yet. Um, well, it's I been like, a while, you know. I want my guests to look better than me, so. You know. Interesting theory. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm very well. I've got my tea here and I'm excited. You're always very well, it seems. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you're you're not you're not, not very well very often. No, very that, very little. <laughs> is that that's fair to say? I, I don't know if I've ever seen you really down in the dumps. Yeah, most people don't considering I live like a hermit, you know. Mm. I spend mm. I spend my time crying on my <laughs> kitchen floor by myself. Oh, man. oh gosh. I didn't mean to bring that out so fast. It hasn't even been 90 seconds. <laughs> well, actually I do cry a lot, but I do like a lot of happy crying, like a lot. Yeah. Uh, all right, now that's interesting. You're a, you're a crier, but you do a lot of happy crying as opposed to the other types of crying yeah like all the time <laughs> it's it's kind of I think it's kind of annoying like I'll walk outside and see some tree that I just love and then I'll just stand there and start crying about it you know normal normal artist mm. stuff it is very I I do feel as though that goes right along with you as an artist um but <sighs> All right, let let because I'm looking. This is what I do with some people. Certainly with you is is before we we get to talking, I go through your Instagram feed. Go, oh. kind of get to get myself sort of brookified. Mm -hmm. You know, I go through and I'm looking, and it's a good idea. Um, I wouldn't not, not. I wouldn't say that as I look through your imagery that there's a lot that would indicate at least at first glance that this is someone who is going to look at a tree and be overwhelmed with happiness to the point where they cry. I know. I know. I don't find that as interesting. So I don't put that in my art, but <laughs> it's very much equally a part it's, of it. But it's who you are though. Despite yeah, that. Yeah, like extremely. I mean, we know each other in real life and um yeah. I'm very happy. No, you you are. You are. So explain to me kind of the juxtaposition a little bit between you being a very happy person and yet there's a I don't want to say pervasive piece of darkness, but there's an element of darkness too much of your art. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Very, I mean, very, it's very intentional because I love darkness and death and all that stuff. Like, I think it's fascinating. I think it's terrifying, but here's the thing. I think that when you, at least for me, when I approach art in a healthy way, it's compartmentalized. So I've got like my happy life and then I've got this darkness that is that I find really fearful and terrifying. So I'm going to make art about that and put that in this other box so that I can control this. And really it's about controlling all these different pieces. I think it's about control. Yeah. Very, very much about control. Everything for me is about control. I'm <laughs> really, it's like a, that, that if I have a problem, it's that. <laughs> <laughs> that you're a control freak in a sense. Extremely. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. This is all right. So this is, this is not, that is not a very good segue into what I wanted to talk about today, but it's an interesting one at the very least in that you're, you have this new series that you're working on or going to be working on, right? Yeah, starting very soon. And it's uh, two words that I uh, really uh, interesting permanence and love. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
permanence and love. Yeah. What? What? It's I don't know a, if I've, I don't know if I've if I've ever put permanence and love together. Exactly, yeah. and yet you do, and everybody does all the time. They're almost connected in such a way that people yeah. cannot separate the two. And right. it's a really interesting idea because I, I've never seen someone talk about this, and that's why I started to really think about it because I thought if we talk about this more. A, a lot of doors will open up for us. And so it started when I began in foster care. I became a foster mother. And when I made that choice, I started telling all my friends and family and everybody said the same thing, which is I could never do that. I could never love a child that I would have to give back. Like I would hate to do that. And then I shared online and everybody said the same thing. Wow, you're such a good person. I could never do that. And I thought, this is such an interesting thing that like, you know, people are saying you're a good person for doing this. I could never do this, even though I see all these people as good people as well. And, you know, what's the block there? Like, why can't you do that? Why, what, what is the reason why? And so as I began fostering and I took these children in, I started to think about what is the thing that's stopping people from loving this child? Like I love this child. And Mm -hmm. I realized it's ownership and permanence and these two ideas, which are really connected, um, largely dictate how we live our lives and who we live them with. And so when I was, you know, when I had my first foster child with me, I thought I love him. I definitely do. I know I will give him up that one day he will leave. And that might be in a day, in a month, in a year. I don't know. And why can't other people feel this way? So I started studying how ownership in terms of having our own children, you know, biologically, or even through adoption that we know are legally ours, Mm -hmm. um, that creates a sense of inherent love. Just like when you have a brother or sister who you grew up with and you're supposed to love them, even though they drive you crazy. And, but there's this (laughs) inherent love, right? And, um, and so I started thinking about ownership, about permanence and how impermanence is the thing that stops us from giving our heart to somebody else. When you know someone's going to leave, when there's an expiration date on something, it's so much harder to commit to loving somebody in that scenario. Mm. You know that, wow, I didn't expect you to say that stuff. It, it resonates with me in this way. So I have two adopted children, which I know, you know, and a lot of people that watch this or listen to this probably know that too. But my confession has been and I've talked about this before. I don't know if I've ever talked about it on here before, but when we adopted our daughter in Nepal, it was going to, it's almost 11 years ago now. Um, we had issues there and they told us that we weren't going to be able to bring her home maybe ever. Right. That was like day one when we got there. And I, I did what I did, or I attempted to do what you're talking about in that I, I don't know what you would call it, but I had made up my mind internally that I wasn't going to fall in love with this child. And that sounds so horrible to me right now, but I did it. I, in my, it was like a defense mechanism. It was like, well, I, this, this is supposed to be my daughter, but it, they're not going to let me take her home. And they're saying, you need to leave her here. And we're like, we're not going to leave her here. And in my mind, I'm like, I can't let myself fall in love with this little girl because we, we, we were not going to be able to bring her home. And, and then I, my heart overruled that. I think my heart overruled my mind. Yeah. And it, it was, it was within like a day or two. And I think there was that internal struggle and I, it was like, I didn't have a choice, Brooke. Yeah. Because it, I thought it was going to be impermanent. Because the, what you're describing are two things that are very valid to this conversation. And one is that, you know, it's a defense mechanism and we, and, yes. and I'm not saying it's a, it's a bad one. It's a, quite a good one. But actually. it is one. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can argue good or bad all day long, you know, but it is we defend one. our hearts against this heartbreak. But the yes. other part of the equation is that we do fall in love with things and people and situations that will dissolve eventually. And right. I think part of it is knowing that we as humans are programmed to fall in love with things and we don't want to let those things go. So let's just stop it before it starts. And I think that's where a lot of people build walls and we put up these defense mechanisms because we know that it's going to end. But what 
I'm interested in is the fact that everything will end. And so, you know, we're willing to, you know, find a life partner who we're going to spend the rest of our lives with, but we don't know if that's going to last another day, let alone decades. And so it's like, why is it that we can, we feel okay with that simply because we don't know that it's going to end right. at a specific time. Right. Yet we feel like we can't love a child who might leave us or who's definitely going to leave us, you know, at sometime. some point. Right. And the, all of this to say, I don't have a certain point about it necessarily as to say, everybody needs to get over it and just love all these children or love all these people, because I don't think that's right for everybody, but it's just an right. interesting topic. Like, how do you deal with that personally? And how will you allow love to manifest through impermanence in your life? So you're not, you're, you're not using this as a campaign or a persuasive argument no. sort of piece whatsoever. You're, well, you're putting it I out there because whatsoever. it is. Possibly okay. in certain ways, How but so? I haven't decided yet. You know, I think <laughs> okay. it's like, I have, <laughs> you know how you, you come across ideas that you feel like, you know, what you want to say about it, but it's not until you've really worked with it for a long time that you come to a solid conclusion. And that's how I feel right now. Like, I think, I think it's also this. I don't want to be a bad person. And I feel myself getting pushy about this topic sometimes. Like when I talk to people and they're like, oh, I could never foster a child. I find myself wanting to say, yes, you could. And here are all the reasons why, you know, and it's like, wait, re rein it in. I don't need to yell at everybody about this. And that's <laughs> their choice. And that's just the honest truth is like, I'm going into this series without an agenda, but I may mm. end it with an agenda. And I just don't know. <laughs> And it, the, it, well, I think either an agenda may be there and you don't, maybe you don't see it yet for whatever reason, Yeah. or, or it may form or it, it may be forming right now. This exactly. agenda. Exactly. And you know, it's not, I'm not, I do have some agenda and it's this, it's not to say you need to foster a child. You need to love somebody that's going to leave you. It's to say, what if we all embrace this idea of love through impermanence and how could that strengthen our current relationships and bring us closer to a huh. better um, relationship with mortality? And in those things, in finding this um, freedom in mortality, then how can we live a stronger and more fulfilling life? And I really think all those things are connected. Well, because is it, is it kind of like, I'm, maybe I'm rephrasing exactly what you're saying, but I want to see if I, if I'm getting, it. is, is it like, what would life be like if those, if you lowered some of those defenses, if you, if you got rid of some of them and made, maybe made yourself at least from your, pers from your own perspective, a little bit, a little bit more vulnerable. Yes, exactly. And what right? if that became a practice, you know, because it's, if you think about anything that scares you, like let's say you're going to start a business or move to another country or something like that, it's going to be terrifying to do that. But let's say this is your fifth business that you're starting or your 20th time moving. It's not as yeah. scary anymore, you know? And so what if we did that with these things that are, you know, existentially terrifying to us, but what if we again and again confronted love without ownership, confronted um, mortality and our own death? And what if we did that so frequently that the fear of it starts to fall away to routine and it becomes commonplace for us to just place our love and our trust in these things? And I, I don't know, but I think it could be healthy and I find it healthy for myself. Do you think like historically, I wonder this sometimes, especially with the last year, year and a half um, regarding death and fear and, and, you know, kind of like, do you think that historically that we, that we as society or societies used to be less afraid of death and now recently we're a lot more afraid? Cause I feel like we are. I think so too. And, you know, without being a historian, my answer I'm not is either right that, you know i think that there was a time when if you lived past 40 that was amazing and people just had right. a different set of expectations surrounding our lives and the longer we live the more we expect longer lives and more fulfilling lives and especially even in the last 20 years where you can suddenly be whatever you want to be and you don't have to get this job that you're supposed to get life yeah. is incredibly open to us at this point and the more open it becomes the less 
I mean, the more we're afraid of it closing, you know, it's like huh, so yeah. many opportunities. Wow. So let's not shut that. What do you think? How do you think it will manifest? Like if, if this is a practice that people were to think about and then take on intentionally, right. Um, kind of embracing impermanence, so to speak, um, and, and dropping their defense mechanisms. How, how is that going to manifest in somebody's life in, in your opinion? I think it could be, it's infinite, but there are some ways that come to mind immediately. And one of them is we tend to hold on to our family and our friends for dear life. Like there are, are the, the lifesaver that that's going to save us in the ocean. And it's uh. not necessarily healthy, you know, like sometimes mm. people come and people go and what if it was okay for people to leave and other people to come in and how much richer could our lives be? And I think about You know, something that I tell myself is that I want to live a thousand lives in one. Like I want to have so many experiences that it's just like, I can look back and think, well, that was that chapter and this is this chapter and people came and people left and how much easier could we live all these different lives if we allowed people to come and go. And then that extends to, you know, humanitarian uh, ways that we can interact with the world, just volunteer ways. Like how much more willing would you be to go to a nursing home and volunteer if you were okay with these people leaving your life in this case, a very, you know, deathly way, but right, um, right. you know, and just how would we interact differently? And I think it's going to manifest in so many different ways. How has it shown up in your life um, in the last few, two or three years as you've, you know, kind of gone into this uh, foster journey, so to speak, How, what, what, what other ways in your life do you see it uh, well, showing up? kind of interesting because I think there's, there are two aspects of this. One is when you become a parent at all, your priorities begin to change and you, you start to revolve around this little human. So there's that, which I think many people who are parents can identify with, which is everything changes because of that. And so people fall away that don't like that situation that you're in and, you Mm -hmm. know, other people come who are interested in it, but in a different way, just from embracing impermanence, I have learned to say no to a lot more opportunities that come my way that don't feel right to pursue opportunities that do feel right. And I've, I think that the best thing is that I just have this sense of calm in my brain where if somebody rejects me, I just say, that's okay. You know, that I'm not right for them. They're not right for me. Life is too short. Move on. And I think that embracing impermanence is the act of embracing um, the world to move through your life as it wants to, rather than trying to harness it and control it. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that sort of mindset can be useful. And cause I feel like as I talk to people, photographers, business people, creatives, artists in general, the, there's a big piece of the, maybe it's a lack of confidence or maybe, maybe, and it's a fear or whatever. We talk about this a lot and it sounds as though to do what you're doing. It, it, and it's weird because there's like a, some, there's some sort of a weird paradox there or something. I feel like where you're becoming, you're allowing yourself to be more vulnerable and yet you're stronger for it or you're stronger as a result of it. Yeah. I think that that's generally true of all things. When you open yourself up to be vulnerable, you inevitably um, find your voice in that, I think, because th- this is the thing. I think that we build a wall, we build a defense, and then we hide behind it so much that we don't even know ourselves. Like we can't even see who we want to be. But when we allow ourselves to love and to get into situations that are unpredictable and uncertain, you have to discover yourself inside of that because you won't make it through vulnerability if you don't know who you are intrinsically. I think that there's a great strength in that. So I think that you learn who you are through these experiences. Let's talk about for a second, the, the, what the process looks like for you. Like what, like even on, even on the daily or or the weekly or whatever it is for you, like as you're, as you're going through and mulling through the the permanence and impermanence piece and, and the love piece and how that's connected from an artistic standpoint, as a, like, as far as making art now with that in mind, yeah. how does that, what does that look like for you? It's been very interesting. Um, it started, so I got this idea a year and a half ago, pretty much right when I started fostering. And it took this whole year and a half to figure out 
anything visual or anything that I could actually do with it. And I think that's the case for a lot of artists. You get this idea, but you have no idea how you want to talk about it or how it's going to manifest. So I spent the whole last year and a half scribbling ideas down on little pieces of paper on my desk and they were all wrong. And I don't know if you have this feeling, but when I write something down, like I know right away if it's right or wrong, I can think it a million times, but then when I see it written, I'm like, oh no, that was a bad idea. And I know when I throw it away. So I just said, it is, it's very helpful. Yeah. It's my superpower. So I, you know, I had ideas that were like about trees and other ideas that were about clouds and it was all like, no, this isn't quite right. And so it was a multitude of things that came together to create this new series in my mind, which I now know is correct because I wrote it down, but, um, it's like, there's this sense of, um, tangibility that I need to bring to this series. And that was the big aha moment for me Mm. where I want to move away from digital work and compositing and create something. I I just felt like with the idea of impermanence or permanence, how can you not have something really tangible to hold and to touch when we talk about this? So Mm. this new series is manifested by being very much about mixed media and collage and sewing and threads. The the new work is called Broken Threads. And it's going to feature people who are physically like through their skin sewn to objects. So, you know, I'll have somebody's hand sewn to a pillow, somebody's arm sewn to a bed um, Mm -hmm. and all these different ways of attaching people to things and people to other people so that there's this physicality of it. Like we are connected, but what happens when those threads break? What happens when we lose those people? So the work will manifest in terms of the, the physicality of sewing people to things and then printing that and collaging the work and then embroidering the prints themselves, possibly printing on tapestry and fabric instead of on paper Um, in so many different ways. I have about a million ideas. It's very much rooted in folk art and this idea of, you know, touching and, and, and bringing to life the culture that you live in. And I feel like this is my culture in a weird, weird way. Like I'm part of this little sub community of people who choose to love through impermanence. And it's really a very small group of people. Well, because there are healthy and unhealthy ways to be connected to people and things. Is that right? And so, absolutely. And so, is it, do you think it'll be that, that it'll happen where someone will look at one of these works, right? And so, I'll be able to look at it and see a connection between, you know, with the sewing and how, however you have it set up. And I'll be able to look at that and, and derive a healthy piece. And someone else will be able to look at the same thing. And it'll resonate with them in a completely different way. And they'll see it as an unhealthy piece yeah. as, as, as representative in something in their life. Right. Definitely. And that's how I intend it. I mean, just imagine yeah. this simple image of my hand sewn to a pillow and that's all it is. So let's just say it's a close up of a hand and a pillow and there are threads going between them. Yeah. You might take that as Um, you know, oh, this person is really connected to their home and their family. And another person might see that as this person is unhealthily connected to physical objects and that's not good. And, you know, just that one thing will spark all these different ideas of what it means to be connected to something. And then depending on my skills as an artist, you know, you take that even further. Like, what does that pillow look like? Is it an old, disgusting looking pillow or is it a brand new pillow? Or, you know, like, what does that look like? And I think all of these things tell a different story to different people. And that's why I love it because I'm not trying to say you should be connected or you should be disconnected, or this is healthy or this is unhealthy because bringing this back to my inspiration in the foster world, Mm -hmm. I have seen foster parents where they're in a very unhealthy relationship where having these kids is not good for them or necessarily for the kids. And on the flip side where people just thrive in that situation. So who am I to say, do this, don't do this or feel this way, don't feel this way your experiences will tell you how to feel about it. Now, talk a little bit more about the love piece, right? I'd I'd like to dive into that a little bit more. How, in your mind, the love piece fits in with the permanence and in the impermanence piece? 
I, this is where we're getting into sticky territory because I don't know if I, if I understand this myself, but I know that it's all connected. And the reason why I say that is because when we got our foster son a year and a half ago, I expected to just love him unconditionally and it did not happen. And I was disgusted with myself, like to the point where I couldn't stop shaking for a week because I was so upset with how my love manifested, which was that it felt empty and there was nothing there. And my expectation was I'm a loving person. I'm an empathetic person. I will just feel this overflowing of love for this child. And instead I felt annoyed. I felt empty. I felt frustrated with myself. And so I started to form this opinion that you can't love someone when it's not permanent. And that was my first idea of this series was maybe I don't have it in me. Maybe I know in the back of my mind, this child isn't mine, so I can't love them. And then as time went on, I realized it doesn't have anything to do for me with permanence as much as it does have to do with just being introduced to a stranger and not being able to love someone that you don't know. And so this child, this two-year-old was a stranger to me and I didn't know him and he didn't know me. And it was like, you know, we're sitting in the car together, just kind of looking at each other like, Hey, um, I don't know who you are, but I'm going to try this out. And, yeah. and so it's like, you know, if you're put in a room with a fellow adult and someone says, do you love this person now that you're in the same room? It's like, no, you don't. And it took a lot of time to develop these feelings toward him. Sure. Um, yeah. And once I did, then it hit me, well, now he's going to leave. And, you oh. know, should I have not even done this? But then right. you know, the richness of feeling love for someone that you know will leave, I would argue is a much more intense experience almost because mm. it, I felt like I was packing in everything that I could to these few months that I had and knowing that they were leaving and especially having a date, it was like, everything becomes intensified, you know, like the, the last time we walked through the forest, you know, every little thing I wanted to capture in my mind. And, um, and, and so I think that there's a huge spectrum here and I don't, that's why I said this is sticky. Cause I don't know that I have exactly my thoughts formed about it. Well, they're forming. This is a yeah. process. It's not like you're done. No, exactly. And, and, and the good thing is I'm not trying to be an expert either. You know, I'm right. just trying to shed a light on this idea that might broaden other people's perspectives. Do you think that it requires a lot of courage? Tremendous courage. I do. And that's, that's the thing is um, a lot of people have said to me over the last year and a half, you're so strong for being a foster parent. And I, I, my response, at least in my head is, Yes, I am. And yeah. I really believe that if you don't have that strength of mind and heart, then it's not going to happen, you know, and, but this manifests in so many ways in every way that you love somebody, there's an element of courage there because there's always inevitably yeah. an element of loss. And when we recognize that and we recognize our own courage, which I think is healthy and not something that I'm saying like, I'm the best, I'm so courageous. I'm saying, yes, I am courageous, but also you are too. And when you mm -hmm. recognize that and you see it as a trait that you can build up and feed, then you're more likely to make those brave decisions. You've given me like so much to process through my mind. <laughs> I, I love your answer that, yes, I am. Um, well, it's, you know, I think we need to start doing that a little more, don't you? It's I like do too. We I do hide too. from courage. We hide from bravery. This, this idea that like, if I say that I'm brave, then somehow I'm being arrogant. But it's, I mean, every, I think everybody has elements of bravery. And so I, I honestly think as an exercise, when, you know, anybody watching this, if you just say to yourself, I am brave, and you acknowledge the things that you've done that have required bravery, you're more likely to make brave decisions. And it's just a fact because repetition, you know, creates momentum. And so when you acknowledge what you've done, and then you figure out where you can go, and you just choose to say yes, it's amazing. It's just, it's just sometimes every so often in, in these, in these discussions, in these conversations, I be, I, uh, I find myself unwittingly transitioning between the interviewer and the audience. It's so I think that as you were saying all that, I became the audience Good. And, did, and didn't know it. Well, I knew it. I always know you're my audience. <laughs> 
I did. I was just like, oh, she's talking to me. <laughs> I oh, am man. talking to you and I'm talking to me and I'm talking to everybody. Yeah. But then I have to, you know, I have to like try to trans transition back to the interviewer so that I can ask you another, another meaningful <laughs> question rather than just like sitting in my pondering of what it was that you just said. <laughs> Oh gosh, so much. All right. There, there's something else Wait, I want to cover. I want to um, ask you a question. Oh my word. Okay. Um, when do you feel you've been the most brave or courageous in your life? Hmm. I think, I think that, uh, it has shown up when there are times when, cause we were talking about earlier how you compartmentalize and in that it's all about control. I compartmentalize too, and it is all about control, but I think the times that I have been the most courageous is that when I have, despite the compartmentalization that I have constructed, um, when I have chosen to give up the control or to acknowledge that I am not in control. I love that answer. I feel exactly the same way. <laughs> Because I try and I try and I try. <laughs> yep. I, I think it's the, I think it's the acknowledgement of the, that situation that it exists the way that it exists. It is what it is. And that so much of your, and not yours, but the fear and worry and anxiety that comes from all of that is, is really illusory, right? It's not, it's not real. It's certainly not rational. It's not really based on anything that is an impending threat, but yet we make it that way. Yeah. And sometimes I make it that way. And this is where I really mess myself up. Sometimes I make it that way to use it as a crutch or to use it as an excuse or to oh, hedge yeah. on something to be able to say, well, you know, there's this, that, or the other, how could I have? So I play the victim, right? Yeah. And I think my most courageous parts of my life have been when I have stood up against myself or against that, you know, really unhealthy way of thinking and being and said, I no. Agree. Right. And I, I feel like what you're describing is, is really just anxiety. It's the need for control. And, and then, you know, like really picking at it to try to figure out how you can, you know, control it more and more and more and more. And then all of a sudden <laughs> that breaks. And then we're just like spiraling out here. You know? It either, it either breaks our on its own, or I've, I've found that we can break it. It's, it's mm -hmm. like a, you can shatter that illusion. Um, and that's there that it requires vulnerability. Um, but then when you do, you, you discover that I think that it, it, it's the truth. Maybe that's like the truth will set you free type of thing. Maybe that's, maybe that's where that comes in Yeah, for me. I agree. Thank you for answering. Right, I, Sorry for well, throwing yeah. further off of no, the I, back. I don't mind. I trust you. Come on. Um, all right. This, I wanted to cover this last piece because you, you posted something recently that, that struck me and, and stuck with me mm -hmm. um and personally resonated with me it's the it's the uh the kafka piece that you that you made with the beatles yeah because before i read it i saw it and i thought of kafka good because i read that in in uh, high school yeah and it and it rocked me a mm -hmm. little bit and i don't know why i'm doing maybe maybe i have a sense of it but i haven't really uh, pursued it much recently, but I've been in, I've been reading a lot of dystopian stuff a lot. It's where I've been for like two or three years, dystopia, 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 like all the classics. I'm just diving in. I think and that's I, wonderful, but you might want to break it up with like something happy. <laughs> I know. I do. I do. I need to throw, I need to throw a couple happy things in there. I, I even if it's just like, I got to sit down and watch a lifetime movie or something. I don't know what it is. I gotta, I gotta put a happy thing into my brain. I'm the so same. <laughs> I've been reading a lot of really dark stuff and I was like, oh, this is getting a little dark. So now I'm reading some book about a witch and a vampire. They're getting cozy together. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you still, you still have the dark elements in there though. You're like, <laughs> it's like these two people are in love. One of them's a witch. One of them's a vampire. It's like, you know, well, I'm not I crazy. I don't want to read about reality. Goodness <laughs> gracious. <laughs> That's so well said. Talk to me a little bit though about your studying with, with, 
I say Kafka, it's probably Kafka. I, you know, I want to get it right. Fra Franz well, Kafka. I, I think that studying with Kafka. Talk to me a little bit about that and what that piece means for you and to you. I am obsessed with metamorphosis. So fundamentally, it's just kind of, I, I, I've always loved it for that purpose. And I've always loved any book or movie or whatever that deals with metamorphosis. So for me on that level, it, it serves that function of taking a look at what happens when you, when you don't take control of your own life and you allow the circumstances of life to transform you to its own will. And that's really interesting to me. It goes back to control partially, but you know, in another sense, it's, it's this idea that you need to, you need to embrace the challenges and the trials and the joy of your life to spin that into um, the version of yourself that you want to be. And if you don't, life will inevitably do that for you. Life will be there mm -hmm. to transform you and to push you into new and scary places that you may not feel ready for. So this is where I will now make the argument that control is a good thing, that introspection and understanding who you are are and where you want to go leads to positive transformation. Whereas the opposite, ignoring who you are and where you want to go will still lead you to transformation, just maybe not the kind that you're looking for. Well, there's, there's that healthy and unhealthy version piece again, right? Of, of control um, or, or, or of introspection, because you can yeah. also get caught if you get caught in it and then you're stuck in it, then that's a problem too. But it is important to wait. Uh, uh, is it uh kind of self-evaluate, I guess, and like yeah. really look at yourself for, for who you really are rather than, rather than a figment or rather than something that's flimsy. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So that's why I love Kafka and I love so many other pieces of literature for speaking about not just transformation and metamorphosis, but about the power of your own mind to control how, what that looks like for you. And, you know, obviously nobody wants to wake up as a giant cockroach in their bed, but no. that's what happens metaphorically to yeah. many people. You wake up and suddenly you don't recognize yourself and you feel like you can't function as you once did and time passes and people stop caring and all of these things happen. And, and, you know, sometimes these things will happen whether you want them to or not, you know, sometimes life just deals you that hand, but how can we take back control? So I made that picture specifically with the Beatles covering the eyes as this way of saying, you know, are you looking inward or are you looking outward? And how are you taking control over your own transformation? And I just thought it was interesting. I, I for me, it's a striking piece where you're kind of using the, the grotesque to ask big, a big question, right? And I, and I think it's, it's, it would be easy for someone to look at it and then shy away real fast but then I would hope that you would ask yourself, why am I doing that? Yeah. Why, exactly. is, why is that happening? Right? And I got some wonderful comments when I released that from you know people it. saying, yeah. I really hate looking at this, yeah. but I'm going to look at it. And it was really nice to see a bunch of people saying that, like, I really don't even want to look at this, but I recognize that there's something that I have to confront here. And that's yeah. like, you know, it's that rare moment in your art career where that happens. And like, I'm trying for that with every piece I make. And then it suddenly happens. And it's like, ah, mm. oh, this is why I'm an artist so that we can think about these things and have these conversations. And yeah, it was a good recentering piece for me. Well, if you want to see it, if you're listening to this or watching this and you want to see it, it's at Brooke Shaden on Instagram. It's just like a, it was like a week ago. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll see it. If you go, you won't miss it. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, um, stand out piece. <laughs> so, so tell me then. Uh, let's let's wrap this up with this. Uh, when uh, when do you think we might start seeing some of these images on permanence, impermanence, and love? Probably another year. Uh huh. Yeah, I have another series to debut first. So oh, there's something up before that. Oh yeah, there's something before that. Okay. That's my series all about very literally death and grief, and. Oh practices in other cultures of what it means to grieve so that's coming in january and then after that i'll be able to start releasing the new series all right we'll keep our eyes open for it um thank you for joining me brooke it's always a pleasure thank you so much until next time when we can talk more about things that matter <laughs> absolutely
Absolutely. Have a great day. Hey guys, thanks for watching this conversation presented by White House Custom Color on YouTube. Be sure to check out our other content and click that subscribe button right there. Right. <laughs> right there. It's there somewhere. <laughs>